He's ready. Amen. Thank you for the prayer. Mercy. Everybody needs mercy. And the people who think they need no mercy need a double portion of mercy. I'm here by the mercy of God. I was a guy that could mess anything up. Good things. I would have these encounters with God and go right back to sin. One day I'm, I just got my first computer. This is going back a little ways. Sucker was about this big on the monitor. And I saw some kind of witchcraft stuff pop up. I was like, wow, man, I, I never really had thought about the computer. I just got it. I got my real estate license. For me, it was just business. I never thought much of, of the capacities of the computer. I didn't even have a glimpse of where it would be today and the things that you could just click and the speed you could get it. But I saw this witchcraft stuff, these cards. And I said, Lord, I, I pray that that this wouldn't come against people, that you would protect people. And, and I'm just kind of in my lazy mode. I was a ticket scalper, so we only had to work every other day or something. I worked a couple hours a day and real selfish. And I started weeping, caring about somebody, brought something out of me that I didn't know was in there as a born-again Christian. I hadn't tapped into it. And I started weeping on this floor in this condo in Mesa, and I kind of wondered, well, what do I do now when it was done? What do I do? I think it was like 1230. And I looked up, and I had my mountain bike hanging on a little, uh, a little hook. And something said, get on your bike and ride. And I'm not overwhelming sensation or a voice. I just sense, get on that bike and go somewhere. And I start riding down the canal. And I end up being, they were just building the Hohokam new baseball park where the Cubs play, used to play. That's how long ago this is. And... I, all of a sudden, I started getting some muscle cramps in my thighs. And I said, oh, man, I got I to gotta stop and stretch here a little bit. And it was so dark that I said, if anyone starts coming across my path, I'm just going to turn the other way and bounce. It's just too dark to be crossing paths with people. And the minute I said that to myself, there was a man in front of me, like this close. <laughs> and I don't know what leads into it, but I start telling him about Jesus. Yeah. Next thing you know, he's holding me, jerking me around, and crying, wow. you're not lying to me. Please don't lie to me. Is this a lie? I said, no, God loves you. And now I'm kind of crying. At the end, he's weeping and he's thanking me. And I get back on my bike. And I said, wow, it's amazing what God will do if you ask him. Amen. See, if you'll take your mind off of yourself right. and think about somebody else, Amen. the devil has a hard time catching you. But when you start thinking about deliverance, oh, it's all about myself now. And you do need to make a critical evaluation of yourself. We need to go back and we need to shut those doors which were open. And the evil one has access, especially if he's going to or fro or something's still in there. Yeah. But he wants you to overwhelmingly think about yourself again and again and again. And what parts of yourself do you think he wants you to think about? The negative parts. All, right. Come on. all the things you did. So after having that encounter with Jesus, no one told me about deliverance. I go back, and I'm only working every once in a while, and, man, I'd go down, I'd jam some rock music. I'd come out of my Mustang GT with some rims on it and some loudspeakers, and I'd be ready to go. Man, it was me against the world, and I was about to get paid. You might have got overcharged if you bumped into me looking for Suns tickets in the early 90s. It was all about me. And then after a few days of that, I wouldn't know how to tap into these things with God on a continual basis. And then I'd, I'd go back to smoking weed. And smoking weed, if you never smoked weed before, don't do it. But eventually what weed does for you is you just become your other self. You're really not even high. You're just that other self. But that other self doesn't really care about anything that's important and certainly not things that are spiritual. And I would go through these cycles and I, and I would feel... Uh, after a couple days of it, like, oh, man, I, I just wanted to smoke this once. I smoked three times last night, two times today. I'm feeling like doing it again. Where, where, where do I go? How do I? And then a little while longer, another encounter happens. 
And I remember uh, I had just been really nasty to a bunch of people. And in the ticket business, your fellow colleagues are either incredibly greedy, drug addicts, or gamblers. So they don't care what you look like. They care about what you'll do to them because they don't want to smoke crack with a swill eye. Uh, they don't want to try to scalp with a swollen lip the next day. Yeah. Have to explain that one. And so you have to just be this person that I really wasn't that person, but if you got in my way and you wanted to test me, I could be that person. Then I would, so I almost get in these fights with a bunch of people, and I get into this cab. And instantly when I look at this guy, I could see a glimpse of something spiritual. I didn't know what it was at first. But it wasn't, it was some kind of fear, but who would be fearful in doing his job as a cab driver working at the airport? And it was this fear, and I, 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 I said something, hey, what's going on with you? And he began to relay all this information. Hey, I, I, I met a woman, and I, I, I was, wanted to be married, and, and the church said I can't get married, and I've been trying to live for God and do everything right and change my life. And the church tells me I can't get married because I don't have a good enough job. I can't guarantee that I'd be a good enough provider for my family. And I said, what church is this? He says, I'm a Jehovah Witness. Just so happens I had read a little pamphlet that that was the reincarnation of Michael the Archangel. And I began to explain it to him. And I said, and what happens when these people pick up another uh, Jesus is they have another spirit behind them. And that was a condemning spirit that wasn't God. And I'm saying these things, and the whole time I'm sitting back like I'm dumbfounded that this is coming out of me. I read a little pamphlet a few days ago. I said a little something like, well, I'd like to share that with somebody. A few of these dudes knocked on my door. Instead of talking with them, I just told them to beat it. I was busy. I got something for them now. That's about my only prayer or consideration about what I ingested. And it was coming out. And at the end, I had already talked the guy into a $40 cab ride for 25 bucks. <laughs> I ended up praying with the guy leading him to Jesus, and he's, something's happening to him. And I know what it is. It's what happened to me. You know, about a year, a few months earlier, he was getting saved. Amen. At that point, I'm like, oh, I can't be greedy with this guy. and I'm giving him money. I'm feeling guilty. That's not enough. I'm giving him more money. He's telling me I don't need that money. And I walk away, and God tells me, at first I said to God, I, I said, or maybe I was saying it to myself, I can't believe that just happened. And the sensation I got, got when I tell people I hear from God, they're like, you hear from God, huh? Well, he doesn't speak in my ears. It's kind of like when Paul heard the voice of God, no one around him heard anything. They saw the light, but they didn't hear anything. And he said, imagine what I could do in your life if you'd only get out of the way. See, this flesh, oh, see, you're wrestling with your flesh, and the demons are, are like the puppet masters. And they know how to send emotional distress, financial distress, concerns, uh, the past, to get you to kind of move and feel things. And then, unfortunately, over time, they'll get you to open these doors to evil. Evil is no joke. The brother that was testifying, something was growling. Oh, I know those growlers. I had to get rid of one of those. That was one of my first deliverances. Had a growler in there. Spirits will come in, and when the spirits come in, they'll get you to treat people any way that you want to treat those people. But as a born-again Christian, the first thing God calls you out of into the light is treating someone like you want to be treated. You're not hearing me. What he's telling you is that you can do what you want when someone has these manifestations. They deserve these type of actions and words that come from your mouth and the lack of love and lack of concern and the lack of prayers because they've done these things.
And deliverance is mandatory. It's a part of the gospel. If you're sick, it's mandatory you get healed. God does not want you sick. He does not want you uh, with mental illness. He does not want you with perversion spirits and anger spirits, self-hatred spirits. He does not want you with that. And you cannot behavioral modify yourself enough to stop those manifestations. And if you did, they'd only move over here and do something else. And you'd be dealing with that. You got done with that. They'd move over here until you die. When they come in, they got to be kicked out. And I know there are spirits that are kicked out the minute you believe. I know that's the gospel. It says, if anyone does not believe in the gospel, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. The minute you believe, something was in your mind blocking you. It was blocking me saying, hey, man, you should get saved. But let's not get saved when we can have sex with beautiful women. I mean, get saved when you're old and you just can't do it. I mean, that's a good time to get saved, right? When you ain't got no hustle when you go and get saved then. That was a spirit in my mind blocking me from the gospel. And when I got old and couldn't do those things, it would be telling me something else. It was never going to stop. The gospel, I, I, I see the gospel every week in the jails. The gospel is God comes down and does something for you that you can't do yourself. Number one, you can't deliver yourself either. You take the authority that God gave you when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and God will exalt you into a place of freedom by his power. Yes. Jesus comes down and fulfills all righteousness. But he's not a high priest that doesn't know how to sympathize with our struggles because he himself was tempted in every way. I mean, he wasn't dealing with some little bit of rejection because kids didn't like you in the third grade. You got a black eye in the ninth grade and kids laughed at you. You were dumped by a boyfriend when you were 16 and broke your heart. No, Jesus was dealing with principalities and powers. He was dealing with the super powerful demons. And defeated them all, standing on the word of God. And so he becomes our high priest. The righteousness of another is imputed upon me. My death that I deserved for the wages of my sin was death. He died in my place and paid it in full. Amen. And you got all these Christians trying to atone for their sins. But brother, here's what you hear. But brother, you don't understand what I've done. <laughs> okay. You, you, you ever heard of Adolf Hitler? Oh, well, what's that guy? Well, he killed uh, four million Jews. Uh, he could have went on to glory by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Jesus said He died for the sins of the world. That if you would repent of your sins, He would cleanse you from the unrighteousness. You're walking around with this unrighteousness that it will never leave because you're holding on to it. You got to forgive yourself. Is that saying what you did is okay? No, you need to make a change. You, repentance is changing, not doing those things, tapping into a power that comes from God, not to repeat that cycle. But my life was that cycle till I got delivered. Amen. We can only tell some of these stories in the jails because they don't have auto recordings. I used to think my wife didn't work. I started being funny like Mike. And saying, oh, my, don't worry, my wife don't listen. Sure enough, she started listening. <laughs> There's some things you just got to let die in the past. But these cycles just kept coming. They just kept coming until the point where I heard God's call. I, I, I felt, wow, I'm called to tell people about Jesus. I, I, I was going through the experiences of, of wrangling my friends. They'd move this way. Well, I don't have this, and I don't want it. I'd come over there, and I'd box them in. I didn't know how to let God plant a seed. I didn't know how to wait patiently and water it. I didn't have the patience to pray in the secret place to see that thing come to harvest. I, I was trying to get it all in one, and what God had to do is sit me down and teach me his ways and teach me how to move out of his way so that he could do what he wanted to do, that he wanted to save my friends. But my friends had to come to a knowledge of Wanting to be saved, understanding the depravity that they needed to be saved, then God would come in and do that. And so sometimes I would get frustrated. Sometimes I would, I had such great success early on because God was showing me what was out there. He was showing me what he wanted me to do. But sometimes 
you're not going to win everybody at the season and the time that you're hoping that they get saved. And so I would kind of drift away from it, like, wow, I must have done something wrong. I must have said it a little uh, confusing. He couldn't understand it clearly. And I would kind of drift away. And I remember one time it had been, uh, it had been four years. And I was ministering again, but my, my vision was ministering in a, on a pulpit, ministering in front of a congregation. That's what I saw on TV. That's what I saw at church. That's what I thought. If you're a minister, that's where you do your, your, your ministry. And I was on the streets of Phoenix, and I was ministering to people. But in my mind, I thought, well, man, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, it's just homeless people. Hey, it's just people struggling with addiction. And the devil was slowly devaluing what I was doing. And to the point where he actually threw the thought in my head and he says, wow, what happened to you that you missed that call when you were called to minister? Ah, oh, see that devil, I know that he sucked a lot of your hopes and dreams already out of you. But it's really not out of you. He's just trying to make you believe that it's out of you. He's a masterful deceiver. And so finally, God begins to show me some more miracles. And now it starts happening a little bit more often. And I started looking at my life and I said, wow, this is really happening a lot. And I started evaluating why it was happening a lot because I was praying a lot. I was asking a lot. I was expecting a lot. I didn't care who it was. I was just interested in investing into somebody. And if you'll go to the lowest of the low, God will give you some people in some prominent places. And I went... In a literal six-month period from that time of those encounters, from ministering to homeless people to being in an NFL, ex-NFL player's house, a multi-million dollar mansion in San Diego up on the hills. When we left the meeting, he drove off in his Ferrari. And when I came in there, all the lights were off and it was dark and he was, his head was sloped down and he was depressed. And, and I used to sell this artwork and I begin to talk to him, and he says, man, this is the first year out of 13 years of being an NFL player that I'm not playing. This is the first time in 20-some years I haven't played football, and, and I don't know what to do with my life, and I, I don't know what's going on with me. And I begin to break down the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, well, I've been going to church, and I do like it. And I said, well, are you born again? Are you saved? He says, I don't know. I said, well, you can know. You can have an encounter with the living God. The guy had an encounter with the living God right there in that house. So I went from the streets of 7th Street and Jefferson to a multi-million dollar house in six months. What was that? God had to get me in a position where I was pliable. People who don't get delivered aren't pliable. God can't work with them. They're stubborn. They've hardened themselves. They're mad at God. They're mad at themselves. They're mad at their spouse. And now it's all about you. It's not about anybody anymore. It's only about you. Look, our economy is booming. I, I've been in real estate for 10 years, no, 13 years now, and the economy is booming now. In this area, it's way higher than it was in the peak of 2007. It's booming. But what happened was we started just taking off like a rocket in 2004. We peaked in 2006, and it all came crashing down by 2009, and everybody panicked. And something like 40-some percent of every home in Maricopa County was either in foreclosure or had to do a loan remodification. And people just were abandoning their properties. And pretty soon it was negative report upon negative report. It was negative voice over here. How bad could, could it get? No one knew how low it could go. And now everyone's looking back, including myself, going, oh, I should have held on. It was bad. But I should have held on because it came back. You're not hearing me. See, your ministry can come back. And it can come back greater than ever. Your joy can come back. It can come back greater than ever. Your family can come back and greater than ever. 
but you can't fold. You can't quit. People quit. I quit. I said, okay. It came back a little. I sold, took my cash. Man, that's, I don't even want to say how much that would be right now in today's market. And so many people abandoned all this property as though it had no value. Why? Because the world said it had no value. The negative voices were saying that it had no value. Every, all you heard was negativity, so people were just getting rid of it, just letting the bank have it, just walking away from it, turning in your keys for $1,000 to the bank so that they could lock it up and sell it at auction. So many people gave away their hopes and dreams, their ministry. They have gave away even their own sound mind now. After years of negative thoughts, they start here, and then they work their way up. And they put a band around your mind where it's just negative thought after negative thought. And now since the secular medicine and doctors don't understand spiritual things, they diagnose you with mental illness. Since they don't know how to get you healed by the broken body of Jesus Christ, they now begin to give you chemicals because in their philosophy, you're just 6,000 chemicals over billions of years. Those chemicals don't work. We'll try other chemicals. Those chemicals will cause problems, so we'll give you these chemicals. And then you deteriorate. And it's so sad. And it happens day after day after day in the world and in the church. If you go look at the divorce rates, the bankruptcy rates, all, uh, uh, all these things are almost the same in the church as it is in the world. And we're called to be the called out ones. When you're called to come out and you start moving forward, whatever's in you has to come up and challenge it. It has to. And the Lord's going to allow it to happen because he wants it to come out of you. But then you've listened to negative voices and, and they've told you, why is God allowing this to happen? If God loved you, why would your husband be like this? Why would your wife do that to you? Why would your business partners rip you off? Why would you have nothing and nobody love you or care for you? And they're lying to you. God's moving you forward so that he can set you free and so that you can truly grow and be the man that you were called to be, the woman you were called to be. And I've seen it in the jails. I've seen people that I looked at them. I don't do it anymore. I almost looked at the most jacked up one and said, oh, you're in luck today. It's going to be good for you, buddy. I, before, I used to just look for talent. And talented, good-looking guys, there was guys in there, man, they looked good, and they had muscles, and they were young, and they were charismatic, and they'd been to Bible college. Those guys never made it. It was always some guy, you know, drifting off in space, little goofy limp, you know, broken heart, busted, and God would begin to do this miraculous. See, what was the difference? Those men knew they needed the miraculous. The other men that had all these things didn't really need a miracle because they could look at their self, they could look at their, their, their charisma, they could look at their training, their biblical knowledge, and they could rely on that. But these people that get these miraculous miracles realize that's their only hope is a miracle. And my pride would keep me from miracles. My flesh would rear up and pretty soon, I began to believe the devil's lies. Man, you're a good preacher. Guys would stop by, hear me preach, and say, hey, man, I, you're doing more than my pastor, man. I like just tithe your ministry. I'm a hot dog vendor selling Vienna beef hot dogs with a little money belt around my waist. Wow, I started thinking, man, I'm pretty good. And then pretty soon, I'd be at church, and my pastor's a pretty dull, he was a pretty dull guy. He's a good guy. I believe God speaks through him, but he was a dull guy, but he was a set-apart guy. And I look up there and go, I go, man, when's my shot, Lord? I already saw myself up there, man. It's time to get me up there and let this thing go as it goes in the jail. Let's get this place going. And then some jail guy would come in. It's like, bro, tell you call me when you're going to be preaching, man. And it would fuel me. Yeah, I need to be up there. And I used to preach completely different. I, I used to, to preach to try to, to move in emotions. Oh, I quit all that. Uh, <laughs> if there's not moving of the spirit, you get pumped up for a couple hours, a couple days, a couple weeks at best, and then it's back to the same old you. And 
That's not worth it to me. That's not worth it to me. I'm looking for God to, to do something in the heart. What he did for me, what I seen him do for these men that come out of nothing and become something supernatural, I'm looking for him to do that every time I preach. But you got to want it yourself. If you're good, if you can work yourself out of this mess on your own, if you got enough to rely on in case God doesn't come through, I don't know. It's going to be a slow process. It's going to be a slow process. But you get to the fork in the road where you understand, but only God. But only God. And I do believe that God sets you on a firm foundation. He gives you clear direction. He puts something in you, and you go without a shadow of a doubt. But when that thing isn't going, then there's something we got to get out of us. And what keeps coming up to the top, the Lord wants you to face it. And when you face it, you realize through the power of Jesus Christ, through the power of his name, through the authority of the name Jesus, you can get it out. You can drive it out. It's real. But if you believe all this doctrinal garbage from church, oh, I oh, yeah, can't have a demon, uh, you know, oh, no, they're over here like a bird. Just get him off your shoulder, brother, and go forward. Come on, man. That don't, I wish it was that easy. Now, does God do miracles like that? Without a doubt, I've met those people. Drunks, cursing all the time, and bam, they didn't do that anymore. Did they still have to go through some deliverance? Yeah, they were angry dudes. I seen him preach like incredible and get teeth grinding mad on the way home. So we all have to go through stuff. God doesn't do everything because he wants to teach us his nature. Remember, God is a man of war. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent will take it by force. The Jews just don't walk into the promised land because a plague hit them. And the firstborn and the secondborn were all wiped out. And it was easy pickings knocking out the women and children. No, they went in and took it by force, being outnumbered, outgunned, outsized, outexperienced, minimal weapons compared to superior weapons, no fortified cities to hide in, and moving in and taking the territory. you got to learn something. Amen. you got to learn something. And the attacks are so subtle. He don't want you getting in this big war for someone's soul. He just work you to death with negative thought disorder. You he can't make you bad. He'll just make you busy for a season until you burn out. Don't have time to finish your deliverance. You don't have uh, time to edify yourself. You don't have time to stir up the faith. You don't have time to preach the gospel to yourself. Then he'll hit you. He's got patience like you can't believe. Oh, he works with pride. He works with low self-esteem. He works with poverty. He works with abundance of wealth. He's willing to play with the chips of the whole world, including all the emotions of the world, all the people of the world. But see, the Bible is always talking about coming out from among them. Coming out from among them is an opportunity to separate yourself to hear from God and do this thing, but when you're among them and you're in them, oh, it's, 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 it's like trying to run a sprint race. I'm beating Usain Bolt if you put him in 10 inches of mud. He's running in mud and I'm running on this rubber mat. I'm winning that 100-yard dash, maybe. Put him in 12 inches of mud. I, I, I guarantee that one. He wants you running in this mud, in this muck. So many people, they tell me, they come here, they tell us of these elementary schemes of the devil. These are not advanced schemes of the devil. There's someone at my work, and they're against me, and they're gossiping about me, and they're, and they're I think they're praying, someone's in there, and matter of fact, I think they're praying witchcraft against me. <laughs> the witchcraft is coming from you, because you are in rebellion. You're taking offense. You're a fault finder. You're the nitpicker. And what was in you just came up and manifested with these people. And now what's in you is blaming something or someone else. Oh, everybody likes to quote Philippians 4.13. All these, all these athletes, man, Evander Holyfield, he beat uh, Mike Tyson and he wore it on his side of his trunks. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but the average man don't read. T 
chapter 3 and all of chapter 4. Well, chapter 3, verse 12 says this, not that I've already attained it or I'm already perfect, but I press on. I'm not perfect. He, this is Paul. I'm not perfect. I haven't already obtained it. He says, that I may lay it whole. He says, but I press on. You're not perfect. You're supposed to press on. You haven't obtained it all the way. You press on. That I may lay a hold of that which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. That's why the Bible says those who overcome shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those who press on. All the Jews were supposed to come out of the Red Sea and into the promised land. But who makes it? Two? They're dying in the wilderness from going back to false gods, wanting to go back to slavery, going back into sexual immorality. Oh, people don't understand the scriptures. Once you're saved, the devil's under your feet. Let me tell you, I just put him down there and do like putting out a cigarette butt. Adam was in the presence of God. And the most amazing thing to me, and you can shut your ears if you're under uh, 20 years old, is not that he had this beautiful garden with no weeds, not all these wonderful plants, all this beautiful crystal clear water coming out of the rivers and streams and ponds and fish. And it was that out of his bone came the most off the hook, unblemished woman any man has ever seen. And the most greatest thing about it was she was made for the man, and she was to be his helpmate. He had the most off-the-hook helpmate. What are we doing today, Adam? Well, let me tell you. This is what I'm thinking, and it was 100% in. Not only did he get an off-the-hook fine woman, but she was uncorrupted, undefiled, unperverted, and he had everything, and he was able to fall. He was able to let all of humanity received the death gene. Sin comes into the world through one man. Therefore, death reigns in all men. You weren't kind of bad. You weren't a pretty good person. Oh, we were by nature an object of the wrath of God. And it's not till the glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that God has to send his only son to come in and rescue us. The ability for a human being to be, dis, to be misled, to sin is incredible. And Paul says you got to set up this infrastructure surrounding yourself with a cloud of great witnesses. Oh, you don't let someone in that inner circle. That's not a great witness. Oh, they're really funny. Oh, the devil's not stupid. He can't so send someone in there that's just needy and a bag of needs and wounds. He's got to send somebody in there with something you like. He's not dumb. Surrounding it. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints as many are in the habit of doing it. Well, I just watch uh, TV on Sundays and get my spiritual fill. There's things you got to do. There's things you got to do. He says in verse 13, he says, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards those things which are ahead. I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He made a covenant with us through the gospel that he would never leave us and he would never, fa uh, never forsake us. He said that if, if we forgot about him, he'd never forget about us. He talks about finishing the work that he began in us. So you walk with Jesus Christ, you never walk alone. But so many people come in here and they believe without a shadow of a doubt they're walking on their own. But according to the gospel, Karina was just quoting it and preaching it before we, I got up here. God holds his word above his name. If he makes all those promises, then those promises are above your reality of the way you feel, the way you think, the way that you deal with things every day. It's above that. That's the truth. And what you're dealing with is only a temporary uh, symptom. Thank you, Lord. He says, I press on to a goal. A goal. Is that a, anything 
you've ever thought about a goal with, with Christ Jesus? The minute I got saved, I realized we got to get people saved. I got to realize I was sitting in that church heard, hearing the gospel and I was being convicted and the devil hardened my heart. He told me, he says, hey, you can't be saved. He said, you tried teachers, coaches, principals, counselors. You tried them all, and you always go back to your old self. You don't want to play games with God. And he made me concede. So then I made up in my mind to harden my own heart. So when the moving of the Spirit would come, oh, a lot of people, they don't like to talk about CCV, the biggest mega church in the valley. But Pastor Don had the Holy Ghost. I don't know what's going on there now, but his, the, the son's dad had the Holy Ghost on 19th Avenue. And he'd get to preaching, and the gospel would start penetrating my heart. And I'd say, nope, i got to stop it back. i got to hold it right there. It can only go so far. Because I've conceded in my heart I can only go so far with God. I can't go all the way and be saved and live right for him. Because I'll fail him like I failed all those people. See, the devil makes all kinds of people concede, concede into not being saved, concede into not being delivered, concede into not fulfilling that goal that God put in their heart, a destiny, a mission to help somebody to do something, and you let the world beat it out of you. Oh, you ain't got the looks for that. Come on, there's people with far more charisma than you. You think God's going to use someone with a dull little mannerism as yours? Oh, come on, he's dealing with billions of people now. And you bought that lie. You conceded a something that God put inside you. And the plan that he had for you was before this earth was even formed. Before he made the first man out of dust, he had this plan. And that devil tries to whittle it out of you. And oh, he'll give you everything stupid. I can't believe the price is right is still on. <laughs> I cannot believe that there's still soap operas. That dude, Victor Maitland, still on. I remember seeing that dude with my grandma. It is, it is this, you, I can't even, now I can watch sports. He'll, he'll, tell, he'll, he'll tailor made something for everybody. I'm not soaring with eagles and looking down on turkeys. We all got our problems. But my goodness, he can put you to sleep with the simplest, stupidest things. Drinking beer? Come on, man, drinking beer is not going to even get you drunk after a while. It just gets you that irritated self that's always not content and tired the next day. I mean, he just sucks life out of people. It's so sad. Circle K's are sad places to me. Oh, I'd like to buy a lotto ticket. Uh, give me five scratchers. Uh, here, let me give you the winner, sir. Put those back and leave with your five bucks. Uh, you know, a Circle K walking out with two 12-packs, like, oh, man, that's a dude close to dying. He's closer than he thinks. There's something, there's a DUI waiting to happen. There's a wife leaving somebody quick here. It is sad what the devil does, and, and no one brings any light. See, we're supposed to be called out people that the light of God shines through us. How's it going to shine through you is that you have some joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Someone reaches out for strength and hope, and they know it's joy. Everybody that helped me in my life, every mentor had some joy. I didn't chase after people that could, you know, rip the mic real good and preach. Oh, I want to be him. Gee, where's your handkerchief? Let me rub it on my forehead and get that anointing. I, I wanted some joy. You get some joy, and you can do something. You get some joy, you can believe for that goal that God put in your heart when you were first saved. And then it can get you to reach out for it and press on. Understand that you haven't obtained it all. You aren't perfected just yet, but you keep moving forward. Now, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, remember Paul said the people are mature, go on to the deep things, which is to discern good from evil. He says, have this mind. And that if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Come on now, you got to let him reveal something to you in the sanctuary. What's you, what's good, and what's evil so that you can get some deliverance? He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Oh, I need people around me that are of the same mind. 
I told you every time I get up, I wait every other time. But every other time I preach, I think I tell people that at one point I wanted to quit this ministry. But I would get around people like Kelly and Mike. I would get around uh, people like Ron and, and Robert. And, and I would say, wait a minute, there's, there's joy in doing what you're called to do. I don't have any joy wrestling because this ministry, and no one's going to pat you on your back like, oh, brother, I heard you had a deliverance ministry. My God, it's incredible. You got 60 people coming down there for deliverance. No one's ever done that. And most likely, no one will ever do it. Few might, some Holy Ghost people. But the world ain't going to love it. You went down and you had a bunch of people and you preached just the love of Jesus. Oh, the world's cool with that. All my friends were cool with Jesus. They were all good with Rick being a Christian and not smoking weed and going to the strip club. They were all good with that. But the minute you start telling them, you got demons. And you better check these demons. You don't care. By the third round I'm talking to you, let me tell you, them demons are coming down for your kids. They flip. They flip because it's on them now. And now you know the truth. And to whom much has been given, much more is required. When you didn't know, he who doesn't know will be beat with a few stripes. But he who knows and does it anyway will be beaten with many stripes. Oh, man, this, this thing's serious. You wonder why the world don't love you? And let me tell you, the world, by the masses, do not love God. And you're wondering why they don't love you. Jesus says, hey, if they hated me, they'll hate you. No servant is above his master. It's enough that he's like his master. People don't realize what it's like for Jesus as a 100% man. Jesus had to grow up as a boy and become a man. He grew in knowledge. He grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with man and favor with God. He grew up as a man, 100% man and 100% God. And his own people betrayed him. His own mother doubted his own divinity. His brothers in confusion. His disciples confused. Uh, been with them so long. Uh, why don't you just show us the Father? This will be enough. Don't you know? Haven't I been with you long enough that you would know that I, my Father is in me and that I am in my Father? He's got the two brothers. He's, hey, can, let's tell you, these people who didn't want the gospel, let me call down fire like Elijah and let's consume these suckers, Jesus. Let's burn them. You see these idiots? Let's burn them. He says, look, you don't even know what spirit you're of. The Bible doesn't record that he was casting those spirits out. Though what the Bible makes me understand is he kept moving, letting those people come to the realization, whoa, God just spoke to me and said, I'm speaking through another spirit. And I don't want no other spirit in me. Oh, God will lead you to repentance. God's word will lead you to freedom if you want it. If we get up here and we start telling you what you need and how you need to do it and how these spirits will come out, we're going to go nowhere. We're going to go nowhere. You've got you to gotta want it in your heart and believe in your heart that there's something in you that God put in there. It's called the Holy Ghost. And with the Holy Ghost, all things are possible. People getting saved, people getting healed, delivered, having a ministry that bears much fruit. I was preaching the other day in the jails. And I told this story. I had a, I had a boss, and he had heard Jesus from me for 10 years. And he lost his income. He was smart enough. He didn't even lose his money. When the economy was going bad, he bought a million dollars worth of gold at $650 an ounce and sold it at $1,800 an ounce. He didn't even lose his money. But what he did for the first time since college was he lost his ability to retain wealth. And he went into a gross depression. The backyard of his house is all glass, looking on the backside of Camelback Mountain. He developed the whole block that he lives on. And he's so down, and I'm telling the crowd for Jesus, I'm at his house, he's like, I'm trying, I'm trying. But he wanted a Jesus that would give him his life back, would give him his money back. And Jesus isn't going to come and change for you. You got to change. The Lord said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not change. That means we must change. Yes. Hallelujah. And so I'm with this minister, and, and I invite this guy out to lunch. I kind of set it up as a business deal, but I'm hoping that this guy can get something. And this guy's got an anointing. This guy has preached in front of 50,000 people at one time. 
This guy, when he shows up, you invite him to church, you get him a first-class ticket, a hotel, a rent-a-car, and most of the time they give you an honorarium of thousands of dollars to preach. And we're sitting down at this barbecue joint, and I said, hey, you know, the business deal didn't look like it was going anywhere. He wasn't interested. He didn't really see how it all worked. And he, you know, he's pretty stubborn uh, in his business deals. So he didn't like it. I said, well, hey, you know, Steve has lost 40 pounds. I'm telling my buddy, I said, he's uh, down and he's going through depression and his hair is falling out and he, he's, he's bad here. And then the guy kind of goes, thanks, thanks for pumping me up here. And, you know, he's kind of cynical about it, but he's not denying everything I'm saying. And, I, and he goes, okay, I heard you're a preacher. He said, what do you got? And the guy goes, well, have you seen any of my videos? Have you watched any of my teachings? He said, I don't want to hear about any of that stuff. What do you got right now? And the guy didn't have anything. He has an anointing for the masses. It's real. I've seen it. I've been there. I've seen when uh, hundreds of people rush an altar. I've seen the moving of the Holy Spirit like Nothing I've ever seen before for the longest times where waves of the Holy Ghost just kept coming down so long. I said, how long can this last? This normally doesn't last this long. And it kept coming. But one individual was sitting there and he was dumbfounded. And it, it, I'm not trying to criticize the guy. It's just because he hadn't been thinking about one individual. He hadn't been working, anticipating one individual. And I told these jail guys, God needs a bunch of people that are equipped for one individual. He don't need a whole bunch of people equipped for 50,000 because there's not too many assemblies of 50,000 people looking for the word of God. But there's a whole lot of individuals looking for the word of God and looking for some help. And we need to be ready to help that one individual. And if you can't help one individual, which this man legitimately has helped one individual. I've met numerous people that were a part of his congregation that he had helped and added to the church. But at that particular time, he wasn't ready. We need to be ready for that one person. Get yourself ready. If you get yourself, your mind off yourself, something will spark in you. God will put a spark in you and start showing you the value of people, the way he sees people. And you'll start having some hope. You'll have some goals to do something for somebody. But when it's all about you, this thing's running in mud. Got to go back to the deliverance center either on Thursday or Friday you know what, I need to call another minister to see what he can tell me. You need another minister like you need another hole in your head. You need the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, his broken body and the power of the name Jesus Christ, and enter in by faith and force your way in. And don't quit. Second Corinthians chapter six, he says, but in all things, we are commended ourselves ministers of God in must much what patience. The greatest minister of all time, Paul has patience and you don't think you need patience. You don't pray for patience. If you want anything to do with any ministry, even a ministry of one individual, you better tap into some patience. You want to be delivered, you better tap into some patience because in the patience you can learn some things, you can hear some things, you can discern some things. He says in tribulations, in needs, in distresses. He says in stripes, and imprisonments, in tolments, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. In purity, in knowledge, in long suffering, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Are you telling me you haven't read these things? And to think we're above these things? Well, you don't understand, it's my husband. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the Jews. I don't care if it's the Romans. I don't care if it's a bunch of barbarians. It doesn't matter who it's from. We go through these things and through this weakness, Something comes out of you, a need for God, some God moving in you, and a little less of you and a little more of him. It goes on. 
And he says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the, by the armor of righteousness, by the right hand and by the left, by honor and dishonor. When was dishonor? That church didn't love me. I had to leave. They didn't accept me and my gifts. They, they just left me to the side. I wanted to minister, and they wouldn't let me. Well, poor you. Boo-hoo. Gee, Paul, Paul got the boot out of a few hundred synagogues. How about that for you? As unknown, yet I'm well known. You think you don't know me? Oh, God knows me. He says, in dying, we beho behold, we live and chastened, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, but always rejoicing. You don't think someone's going to be sorry when someone leaves you? You don't think someone's going to be sorrowful when you lose something, when you lose a job? When you lose the opportunity, when you get the revelation of what the devil stole from you, you don't think there's going to be a little bit of sorrow. That's a natural human emotion that God gave you so that you would hold on a little tighter to your valuables. The next time they come around and the same situation comes around, you don't repeat that cycle. Yes, you're going to be sorrowful. He said, but sorrowful, yet I'm always rejoicing. Come on, you think you just read this one time and I just do it. I read it and I do it. No, you've got to practice this over and over and over again. As poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing and yet possessing all things. Oh, then he goes down in verse 17 and he's quoting Isaiah 52. And he says, therefore, come out from among them. And be ye separated, Amen. says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and you should be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We got to come out. I understand you don't go to the bar and you don't smoke weed and don't have a medical marijuana card. He's talking about coming out of this negative thinking about you. It's all about you. You watching TV, it's all about you. It's gone up to such a high degree that they're playing reality shows about the real housewives of these different cities in America. And I can't tell if it's all fake or if those people really act and think like that. Because if they act and think like that, we're, oh, this is scary. We are watching demons in full manifestation. When you watch into these lustful shows, and it's all about this dating, oh, my God, uh, I, I, ladies, I know you got a little, oh, it's just a heart for a man, and I would not let your man see that because every man, is what he does is he think about, well, man, how's that going? Man, that's, this is going to be a good night. I hope she picks her. But he's sitting there dumb th like you want him to be, eating popcorn because you like it. Are you kidding me? Watching a show like that, you're putting your place in a position, oh, the lights are out, and he's behind the closed doors. It's commercial time, and the girls, would you like another soda? And the guy goes, no, I'd like to keep my train of thought what's happening behind these closed doors. TV is mind control. The Bible says, put no vain things before thine eyes. I'm trying to get better. I quit watching football in the pro level. I still watch college because that's just a bunch of innocent kids getting beat up for nothing. But... <laughs> The pros, those guys are so egotistical. Their dances and, uh, you know, their muscles. And I've seen them come and go. I played football with 17 guys from high school, junior college, and Division I football that went pro. One I saw was, was an elite athlete, cornerback. I just was with him the other day. He's a good man of God. I had a great conversation. I believe the Lord put us together. But let me tell you, me and him got no bodybuilder physiques, and mine was better than his. He went from the top of the food chain to a run-of-the-mill house dad. This vanity is a delusion. Your money is a delusion. The average pro athlete goes broke within five years of his playing days. It's only for a minute. What you do for people is for eternity. When you invest into yourself and into the word of God and get in the ear for God, this lasts for the rest of your life. And you can't just tap into it and turn it off and tap into it and turn it off. It won't work. You got to honor God when he does something in your life. Even the deliverance. I, I, I messed up my deliverance. I... I 
I was delivered like a rocket ship. But the devil was hiding in some areas. I sat down with Mike. Mike says, hey, you know, uh, I was coming all the time, but I'm not the type of guy to get to know people. And, oh, preacher, hey, I'd like to just know you. My name's Rick. I love your teacher. I, I just kind of go my way, do my thing. If we're meant to be together, we'll be together, and, and God will put it together. Otherwise, you know, I got what I got, and God bless you, and I'll be going and taking what you taught me, and praise God for it. But uh, he puts out this from the, he says, hey, a few of you guys have been coming a whole bunch. I'd like to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you could sit down and you could do some ministry. I'd like to talk to you. So we sit down, and he gives me one of this evaluation sheets, one that if I've seen you, I'll give it to you as well. And he gave it to me, and I just looked at it, and he went in the other room, and I was you ever raped anyone with witchcraft? I was like, what's this? We're talking about ministry, about me getting up doing some ministry. He comes back, and he goes, did you fill that thing out? I go, oh, you wanted me to fill this out? Yeah, I did. Uh, well, he, goes, he sits down to the Lord. Is there anything on there that jumps out at you? Is there anything wrong with you? Is there anything going on? Anything you need prayer for? No, nah, man, I'm good. You ever done any of these things? You ever been in Trent? No, nah, nah, I'm good. It's all good. He says, well, uh, okay then. And he looked at the clock. I said, okay, he's, he's ready to move on now. Okay, well, all right. And he goes, well, I'll use you up front. Let's, let's go ahead and get this thing started. You come up, just... I'll send you here or there. When I got someone going, you just help them. You know the drill. Just keep them going. Keep it coming out. I'll ask you some questions. Maybe I'll give you some insight how to keep it going. And I jump into it. But there was some stuff still in there. There was still some stuff in there. And it was hiding. I still love money. I had money. You don't have to worry about loving money when you got money. Half my money was gone, but I still got a lot of money. I was still good. I, I still got a nice house. I still got stuff. Still got available cash. I still got investments that were doing fine. They were going up. Others went down. Some went up. I'm good. And deep down, I, I, I always had this thing where, hey, you don't need to like me, but you need to respect me. If I do something for you and you don't show any kind of appreciation, boy, I'll ditch you faster and you know what. You better tell me thank you. Lord can't work with that. We had to go to another level. Because there's a lot of sick people that can't say thank you. Their minds are so wrapped up in things, they, they forget to say thank you. We can't work with that. And this stuff was popping up. And when it would pop up, it would start assassinating me. Bad, like I had never dealt with this before. Who are you to think you're up there casting out devils? Who are you to get up there and think you're Mike Smith? That guy's a savant, man. He sits in his, his house. I bet he doesn't even have pictures on his walls. I bet that house is white in the outside and the inside. You ain't like this guy. He's some kind of Jesus freak. You're not. You're a normal person. And it would start making sense. Like, yeah, he, he's, he's different. Yeah, that guy, man, I could tell that Bible study that he broke down that night, that was... That was a couple hours worth of research. This was about 15 minutes. I'll just go with what the Holy Ghost gave me last week in the jails. I'll say, hey, that one will preach. We'll go with that. But he's investing hours. It started to make sense. And slowly he started chipping at it. But God was so merciful, I would see a great deliverance. God was so merciful that someone would go through a stumbling block, and God would give me a word to show me that I had a part to help out, that he was using me. It wasn't all about one person or another person, but it was about us that came into agreement. But I still wasn't grateful for it until a few years in, and I'm looking for an out. I want to preach in ministry. I want to, I want to be able to get up on a pulpit and just bark at some demons, and they all fly out, and I never got to get dirty down in those aisles and laying hands and counseling people and giving them my number, and I need someone to come and wipe the sweat off my brow like those other preachers. <laughs> I, I mean, you, look, you start looking for an out when things are hard. When something's in you that demands someone appreciates what you do for them, and you don't get that, then you're looking for an out. Because it was all about the way you wanted it. The world isn't all about the way you wanted it. No. Marriages don't always start, or midway through the marriage, always function the way you wanted it. 
you got to press on to the goal is, yeah, I do want a good, good marriage. Yeah, I do want a fruitful ministry. you got to reach and press on for it, believing that God wants the same thing because he put that in your heart. Because things that are of your will are going to die. And they did. They did. Hey, I've been, I had to come to myself. I, had to, I said, hey, man, I've been preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and not taking authority and binding these devils. And you know what? I had a handful of disciples in a decade. You can get a handful of disciples in one pod now. Guys, tracks all up all over their arms. Hey, man, when you were calling out them demons, something came up and out. I was crying and I was coughing, but all I know is when I was done, I was free, and I knew in my mind I would never relapse. Before I went to rehab, I always knew back there there was a chance. I always knew when I got myself clean, I might one day. He said, I know I'll never go back. Amen. You have to labor for those things. You got to believe for those things. You got to expect no glory for yourself when those things happen, yet you got to take joy in making another man rich. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 and 18, when he was calling them to come out and be separated. He's quoting that from the Jews coming out of Babylon in chapter 52 of Isaiah. And he says in verse 11, he says, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, and you shall no go, not go out with haste, nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Oh, see, the Lord's got to protect your backside because the enemy would try to sneak up and devour you. But that verse tells you the enemy's not going to do that because the Lord's protecting your backside. Your job is to be going forward. He's got your back. Amen. It's a cost. Man, my friend's got jokes. Over here, we can laugh at simple things. Around here, Ron is the funniest guy. No offense, Ron. You did get the number one. My friends have done things. My, my best friend since I was 14 has done business ventures with LeBron James. Him and Bernie Kosar, who won the national championship, played 15 years for the Cleveland Browns, are good friends. Him and uh, LeBron James, Allen Iverson, all these guys doing these things together. He knows the Maloof Brothers parties, and he's given the real world suite when he goes up there. It's this thing where the real world on MTV was filmed, and it's a, it's a, a suite in that casino, and he's been there and done these things. These are incredible stories. The Lord says, come out from those people. Come out from them. It costs you something. That was my buddy. That was my buddy that if my daughter needed $100,000 surgery, he, he would have wrote the check. That was my buddy that, that uh, if we're outnumbered six to two, he's swinging first because they disrespected me. He, he was a true friend. We had been through everything together. We grew up together. And then when you start departing, the devil always tricks them to take an offense. Oh, they think, here, Rick thinks he's better than you. You know, Rick thinks you need deliverance and you just got a bunch of demons in you. He'll, he'll trick them. My one friend, we've been best friends since high school. We've been through everything. And the devil tricked him that I betrayed him at a high school reunion when his wife was saying good things to all these girls that Rick is a, is a counselor. He helps people. He, he's reconciled marriages. He's a real changed man. He doesn't do these things. He's the real deal. And I felt like a million bucks. All these girls that thought I was a loser were patting me on my back, looking at me like, wow, we can't believe you're a man of God. I'm saved too. I, I was sharing with one buddy, this one guy, he never liked me. Oh, I, I grew up with him since we were first grade. He never liked me. And I'm telling my story. His wife is weeping. I would have never said nothing bad about my buddy. And he thinks the devil tricked him. Hey, you were talking bad about me to those people. That was one of the highlights of my year. I was going through a defunct, failed business in 2008. That reunion was great. I wasn't in the salty mood to be tearing someone else down, but the devil tricked him. It's sad. It's sad. Hey, I, 
I used to help him. He'd be at the casino, and uh, I'd come get him. I mean, I was fine with that. Him calling me at 2 in the morning. We were friends. Hey, I was willing to do something for him. I liked the guy. I felt bad anything I ever did to him. I had remorse. I felt like I had to go above and beyond the friendship. They're all cut. There's nothing. They don't, I don't have their phone number. I tried to, to call them once or twice, three, four times. They, nothing. It's over. It, 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 there's a little bit of, oh, that's, that's, that's a bummer. But I got to press on. Amen. And I got some new friends. I got some new friends. They don't have as good as jokes, but they got my back. Amen. Hey, I get in a jam. I best believe Ron will pray for me. I best believe I'll say, hey, Ron, keep me in prayer. I best believe he's not forgetting about me. Amen. I bet if I need any wisdom, I got friends that can tell me biblically what's going on, what direction. Uh, I have eyes to see. There, there's a value to what God has given me in exchange for those things that were a pulling back to my old nature. It's a cost to come out from these people. Sometimes it's even your own family, your own children now. The Lord's going to take care of your backside. He's going to go before you. There's no temptation that's going to crush you. It's sad. Every time I, 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 I went backslid in any way, shape, or form knowing about deliverance, I can look back on the moment when I made the decision to do it anyway. I've never bounced into sin. How did I get here? I know exactly. I was mad. I had to tell him the way I felt. I felt I had to expose what was done to me. I, I did whatever, and I was at the crossroads always. If you're not at the cr crossroads when you sin, then that devil has deceived you. If, if you can't understand right from wrong, we need to drive those spirits. You need, to, you need to rely on someone else's anointing to get those spirits out of your brain. Those are some form of mental illness. Every Christian should have the liberty to understand which way you're going and not be confused. That's the freedom of Jesus Christ. I got a, I got a friend. He's a good friend. He, I've been friends with him, met him at jail. Sometimes he doesn't like to hear it. But I say, hey, look, that behavior, smoking that weed, I'll tell you what, every time I seen you fall, every time I saw you fall, it started right there. So that's where we got to stop it. It doesn't seem near as bad as on down the road, but it's always the beginning point. You got to stop this devil at the beginning point. No one ever gets drunk until he takes one beer, until he goes to Circle K and buys one bottle. No one slips into smoking bud unless they score some weed. No one ever slips into adultery until you got lust in your eyes and you're drawing someone to you. No one slips into greediness unless you're not content with what you have. No one slips into depression unless you let the devil suck your joy out. You got to catch him right there at the base. Second Corinthians 12, 3. For such one I will boast, yet not of myself. I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. I will not, I will speak the truth. But if I refrain, least anyone should think, of me above what he sees in me or hears me to be. And at least I do not be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A thorn in my flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, least I be exalted above measure. That one will make you scratch your head. It was sent. And Paul's praying three times that the Lord would take this thing away. And the Lord says back to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. He's telling you, I, I, I got you. If the devil tries to put something in you, I'm going to make him pay by giving you more. He thinks he can hold you back. That thorns in your flesh. Watch the revival you're about to go to. 
Watch the authority I'm about to give you over those demons and principalities that are running that synagogue. All the details, everything that's happened in Jesus' ministry, they said they couldn't contain it within the books or it would be too big. The, all the things that were contained in Paul's ministry, oh, he had a long ministry. Jesus was with three and a half years. Paul had a long ministry. Some of those revivals and miracles and healings of leper colonies and people being raised from the dead, I guarantee you they were off the hook. God was saying, I got you. Don't worry about that devil, what he's doing to you. You keep pressing on to this upward call, and I'm going to go before you, and I'm going to go behind you. Anything that's in you, my grace is sufficient. I'm going to sustain you for what I've called you to do. He's not taking you out. He's not holding you back. If you think he's holding you back, you'll be right here and go nowhere. You'll leave. You won't leave the sick bed. But he pressed on, and he got delivered from that thing. That thing's not recorded through through all Ephesians and Galatians and, and uh, all the books of Romans and Hebrews. It's not recorded in there. He was able to overcome because he wouldn't hold back. I, I guarantee you there's some things that don't get fixed tonight. There's some marriages that aren't reconciled. When you come home, no matter what wonderful touch of God you get from here, you don't go home to loving arms of your spouse and it's just an embrace like the newly, like you're just married again. Some things are going to take some time. You're fighting mental illness spirits. Well, let me tell you, you can get up enough out of this place tonight where you can start taking every thought captive, where he doesn't run your mind. But we're going to have to keep chiseling these things away because these spirits were not given to you. And one day you pick them up over a lifetime. God's going to ramp it up and it's going to be way faster than the time period it took you to pick them up. But it's going to take some time. But nevertheless, you can do good to people. You can be kind to people. I have inmates all the time bring tears to my eyes by being kind, by being caring. I was taking one to the bus stop the other, the other week, and he wants to call this other inmate, and this other, well, no, it's another guy, and those guys used to fight so bad, I used to have to break them up once. It was a big dispute. Police got called. And now he's going full of this joy. And he goes, hey, can I borrow your phone? I got to call so-and-so. I got to tell him I'm going back home. I'm like, dude, he don't want to hear you. You're going home for two days, dude. Just save it. He's a grown man. He's good. I want to call him. And he got on the phone. like, hey, I just want to let you know, man. I'm going to keep you in prayer. Keep me in prayer, man. Stay strong, brother. I thought, wow, man, this is some brotherly love. He, he, taught, he tapped into some Jesus. This is some Jesus stuff. My carnal man, we just got done sweeping out a job site. My face was all full of dust and asbestos and everything else. I'm just looking to go home and take a shower. He's concerned about somebody else. He's concerned about getting a team of prayer warriors so he don't fall into the same traps he fell into time and time again. There's one of the most powerful prayers. Kelly's got the most powerful prayer ever prayed for me. I kept it on my recording and pray it, pr played it whenever I was down. And unfortunately, one day I hit seven and erased it instead of star to save. I kept it for a long time. But the second most powerful prayer that was ever prayed for was with this guy that came here for deliverance that had massive amounts of demons, very slow deliverance. It wasn't like a rocket. It was slow and steady and up and down. And he prayed this prayer for me. I was at a Chipotle. I ate that burrito with another kind of smile. People probably thought I was crazy. I received that prayer. I knew that was from somebody who really loved me, that really had something of God in him, and it came right out of him onto me. When you're ministering to people, is what I'm trying to explain to you in closing, is they minister back to you. There's an investment into people, and you get to be a recipient back sometimes. The guy that led me to Jesus, I led him to this place when I learned about deliverance. He was the most miserable guy I knew. You had to brace yourself before you pressed that last digit of his phone number because you knew something rough was coming through that phone. <laughs> Guaranteed. Now, every time. And, hey, he led me to the Lord. He got my first deliverance by praying for me one time. And then I helped, I brought him here when I learned about deliverance. And hey, there's, there's, a, there's a give and take here. A lot of times at first, it's a lot of giving. 
but I promise you'll get something back when you need it so that God lets you know what you're doing is not in vain. It's not some random thing, but it's an ordained thing of God for his glory and that God will use the body of Christ to help you out. Hey, I, I don't know if you remember Sister Vivian, but uh, she was bold. Let's just say it that way. And she could preach. She, she'd get up here and preach. Sometimes I'm like, I got to follow that. She'd just do the introduction. <laughs> and uh, she's the exact opposite of my wife. My wife is very calm, cool, collective. If you've got anything insulted to say to her, she's going to think about it for a while. And once it completely downloads, because she'll think about everything, then she'll look at you and give you a response. And Vivian will just go. If it's the truth, she'll let it be known. She'll go. Well, she'd call me every once in a while and let me have it. Bro, what are you doing with your life? You've got an anointing on your life. You should be down here preaching. What were you? Matter of fact, what were you Friday? What were you doing? I'm like, who is this crazy chick? Who are you to be calling me? You, as far as I know, the head of this ministry is Michael W. Smith. There ain't two. But what she was saying was the truth. And she cared about somebody not doing what they were called to do. And the Lord said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to speak to you in a way you don't like to hear it because it's going to be said something you don't even want to hear. How you like this? And it, I couldn't say no to anything she said. I would end wrestling mad, want to tell her, hey, you know, why don't you email me? Uh, don't call me. And at the end, I'd go, okay, thanks for calling. <laughs> because she was telling me the truth. Sometimes we got to hear it rough. But it's unfortunate. It can't all be cookies and cream. And I guarantee your deliverance, there ain't no sweet talk to these spirits. There's no sweet talking them. These things are relentless in what they do. They don't stop. They don't quit. They don't get tired. They don't get discouraged. They don't get distracted. And what people don't understand is when the demons come out, the Bible says they're going to these dry places, but they keep coming back to take a look if there's any open doors. Cain's about to be taken over with demons, and God has to come down and have a conversation with him. And he says, look, if you do well, you'll be accepted. If you do not do well, know this, that sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is to have you, to make you a murderer and bash your own brother's brains out with a rock. These things are vicious. When you start getting deliverance, you keep that door shut. And you don't open that door because you ain't like the next guy that's got to go down to the bar and have too many drinks and then get a little habit of bringing back some alcohol and then stumble into drinking every day. No, you go from being sober for a year to opening the door and bam, being a dead drunk again. You got to keep the door shut. This is a fight. And they'll subtly knock on your doors. They'll knock on your door like a friend. Just, oh, just one drink. Hey, how you doing? Uh, oh, hey, just a little flirt with, a, with, a, with some lady. I get out of Dodge. I don't, I don't, I know them lust demons. I used to have lust demons. I was talking to some lady the other day. She was some college lady recruiter. And all of a sudden, I, that was kind of a, I said, ooh, that was kind of that side smile kind of, ooh, that's a, I got a couple, more. I said, okay, boom, I was out. I don't, sure, this flesh is deceitfully wicked. It starts liking figures and faces and, and sing you a song. I don't want to hear no song or what could be, how it would just go down. I don't want to play that. I get out of there because I know what they're like. They're trying to bash my door in and bash my brains out. They hate my guts. Going to these sex offender units, 
casting out some monster demon from some guy who raped his child for 17 years, who was raped himself, some transvestite hooker getting delivered who was a prostitute for 17 years, had thousands of, of, of tricks under his belt and crazy. You go war, even war against those devils, they're going to wage a war against you. I don't think you heard me. This is a fight. Well, I just like to go to church. And first we start out, we sing four songs to Jesus. And by the third one, I'm really clapping. And, and we got the praise dancers with flags. And my preacher's a really good preacher. You know, he really knows the word. And he's really a man of God. His dad was a preacher. And, and this is really where I like him. We got a home fellowship group on Thursdays. And we get together. And we really love each other. And we break bread together. And afterwards, we have soda pop and ice cream sometimes. Uh, look, you better wake up and smell the roses that Christianity is a fight. And you got a war, and that devil will use any person as a vessel against you, and you better be on guard to make sure that they're not a plant. And you better know when to get up out of there and get going. And if you failed a thousand times and you're here, you're in a perfect place. You're in a perfect place. You're here. This is a perfect place. He's giving you another chance to stop doing what you were doing. We can stop right now. If you couldn't stop, you wouldn't have been here. This is proof you can stop. You sat and through this whole message. This is proof God led you here. This is proof that he wants to help you. The fact that you amened it, shook your head in, in, in acknowledgement of anything I said, that, that means it can happen right now. It can happen right now. God's not a respecter of persons. I've seen him restore people that just habitual backsliders that you can't believe. It was unbelievable. Things they had done. There's people coming here. They, 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 they were preachers at one time, ministers. Doesn't matter how bad it's been. We deal with right now, we got a chance. And it's a chance to get free. It's a chance to walk with a new perspective and a new level of freedom, with a new level of reverence, with a new level of warring to keep those doors shut. And God, just like Karina said, she set it up perfect. God holds his word above his name. If he said that he would deliver us and he would go before us and that he would watch our backside, then we got to have zero fear. We can't fear a devil that was already defeated. Jesus faced every temptation and defeated him. He died in our place, goes down to hell, and then he disarms those demons in hell. All power and victory is given to him, and he sends the Holy Spirit from the right hand of the Father to empower us over them, so we now switch the position and we tread over them. He no longer stomps on us, we stomp on him. And it's by faith. It's by faith, faith in his word and in his promises. It's faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in faith that he loves us and that he wants to help us. I know you prayed some prayers time and time again, but let me tell you, maybe it was an investment for you to just to be here right now and to get what you want right now. Don't be discouraged and say, Lord, you were too long. You took too long. Hey, maybe he was just teaching you patience. Maybe he was just teaching you a perspective of the whole thing so you wouldn't backslide, so you wouldn't repeat the same cycle, but you could move forward from this day on. But we can trust him. And it always comes down, before we pray, into the two holds. If you will not repent, it's not going to work. There's no gospel without repentance. You have to make up in your mind, I'm going home, and I'm ditching that adulterous relationship. I'm ditching that porn uh, subscription. I'm ditching the drugs. I'm ditching the alcohol. I'm ditching my buddies that we just chase things of the world. I'm ditching it. Make it up in your mind. I'm turning. With repentance, all the promises of God are available. And the second one is forgiveness. Forgiveness is in your mind. I prayed in my mind to forgive people. But in my heart, Man, you get too close. Those dudes could have caught some anger and some vengeance. But I was a good Christian, and I was a trained Christian, so I could parrot. A parrot really can't speak. He's just mimicking what he heard. He's just repetitiously barking out what, what, what words were taught to him. He doesn't understand conversation. 
he understands repeating. I was just parroting because it was the right thing. To, I forgive them. I forgive them, Lord. I wasn't, my heart was, dude, I, you owe me and I'll smack your face. That's what was in here. You have to release what is in your heart. This is not of God. This was given to me by the enemy through a bad and tragic situation, through years of torment and abuse. This is in me, and I got to give that to God. And how I give that to God is doing what God told me to do. That's what he told me to do. I don't need to question why or how he told me to give it to him. Cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. Amen. These cares and hurts, I pass on. I forgive them. I turn them over to you, Lord, because without you in their life, they'll end up going to hell. But with you, they can be saved. I can't bank on anybody else praying for them. I can't bank on them changing. Lord, I'm praying you'll change them so they don't do what they did to me to somebody else. I care what happened. I'm praying for them. I know my battle is not with people, but it's with demons and principalities and powers and these forces of evil and wickedness in high places. I don't want to deal with demons anymore. I'm turning it over. They don't deserve it. I'm turning them over to you. And that includes yourself. That includes yourself. When I was playing football all summer long, the countdown, two months before two a days, party on. One week before two days, party on. Two days before two a days, party. We knew we could not take that junk into two a days. There was no way on God's green earth you could go to practice for two hours a day, sweating, having three homicidal maniac coaches screaming their guts up at you from morning to night. You could not come in as a drunk and an alcoholic. You had to leave it behind. It's, the countdown's already been on to let these demons and this past stuff go. You've already been dealing with it for years. It's, it's, it can't go on into this new life. It can't go on your negative thought disorder. You forever going to sermons, forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of truth. Oh, well, that really was a word. Wow, that was refreshing. That was a manna word. That was a rhema word. Dude, you need to do what you're hearing or you're going to deception. Today's the day you can't bring that old life in to this new life with Christ. Amen. It won't work. There's zero chances of it working. If it worked, it would only be seasonal. Then you go right back to the same old you in the lowest point. Going to have to come back up out of that. Release yourself. People hurt people so bad. It's, by the grace of God, it's never happened to me. I mean, I've, people's lost children, wives have taken the kids, moved out of state, lost them. I know a guy lost his kid for 18 years. When he finally got a hold of him, the kid wasn't interested in him. And then two years later, the kid died of a heroin overdose. I've seen the most terrible things. I'm not trying to minimize what has happened to you, but I know that God can heal you and help you right now. But you've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. You've got to trust him. We can't fix the past, but we can fix the future. The devil can control the future if you don't let go of the past. It's a fact. Amen. Let's pray right now. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody watching online. Blessings to them. Thank you for sending all these people, Lord, down here to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come before you, Lord, and we, we come on no righteousness of our own. Zero, Lord. Zero. You led us to this place. You equipped us for a time such as now. Lord Jesus, we ask you to come. We just want to humble ourselves before you, Lord. In humility, Lord, I tell you that I'm sorry. I want to start with all the people that I hurt. I want to start with all the people that I let down. I want, to, I want to just tell you I'm sorry, Lord. Those were your sons and daughters, Lord. It was my way or the highway, and I'm sorry. It's not my way anymore. That way does not work, Lord. I'm so sorry. I always think I can play with sin and take an inch 
and get away with it. But the devil's looking for the mile. I'm so sorry, Lord. I, I had already went through the cycle numerous times. I thought I could just look at one picture. I thought I could just have one drink. I thought I could just have one toke. I thought I could just take one offense and have one bad friend. Forgive me, Lord. I've hurt you and I hurt your people. Have mercy on my soul. I apologize, Lord God. Starts with me, Lord, and I receive your forgiveness. I believe you truly want to forgive me, to pardon me from my sins, to release me from my trespasses, that your word declares that you'll take my sin and throw it into the sea of forgetfulness where you count it against me no more, and I say hallelujah to that. Thank you that I don't have to walk with my guilt and my shame anymore. I don't have to walk with these regrets. I have a choice. Today I choose to press on to the upward call to reach on forward to what lies ahead. And Lord, I want to forgive from my heart, Lord, not to parrot a prayer, but from my heart, I want to forgive myself. I know of the things I've wrecked and lost. Many I'll never get back, but today I forgive myself. I release myself from the failures and the regrets, the sorrow and the pain. Lord, I forgive my family now. I've been hurt real bad when the ones I love the most treated me the worst. I want to forgive my mom and dad and for their deficiencies, for their lack of knowledge, for the lack of instruction in raising me. I'm sorry for blaming them, knowing that it is true. My life could have been different, but Lord, I'm here now, and it was what it was. I release them from their failures. I repent of judging them, and being critical to them, for rebelling against them. I forgive the spouses that cheated and betrayed the marriage bed. I forgive the spouses that failed to support and encourage rather chose to discourage and abuse verbally and emotionally and physically. I forgive them, Lord. I release them from my soul. I forgive those people that looked over me, looked beyond me like I was nothing, treated me like trash, stole from me. I release them. I, f I pray for them, Lord. Let them all come to the knowledge of Jesus. No man owes me anything. If there's any debt, my debt is to you, Lord. I owe you my life. You paid for it in full. It rightfully belongs to you. And as it rightfully belongs to you, I'm going to line myself up with your word and do what you told me to do. And you told me to fight. I don't understand everything about demons, but I can understand their manifestations. And what's been going on in my life is straight from hell. And I'm done with it. And I believe, Lord Jesus, you give me the power of your name as being in covenant relationship with you through your son, Jesus. I have access to his name, the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And your word declares, which is the truth. It's above your name. Your word says that at the name of Jesus Christ, the demons will flee. Yes. I'm going to use that name in faith right now. Yes. I bind discouragement, and quitter spirits. I bind hating and gossip and quitting. I bind depression and anxiety and fear. I bind any curse that was ever spoken over me in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I bind the spirit that told me I was disqualified, that I was not worthy enough, that the, that the goal was over and gone. I bind that spirit in the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of God. I bind addictions to porn. I bind addictions to alcohol and drugs. I bind sickness and disease spirits in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I command you now. Command them. Come out of me right now. Come out of me right now. Use your faith. Come out of me right now. Come out of me now. Demons from molestation, molesting others, being molested. Demons, come out right now in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. Fight now. Press in and fight them. I don't care if you yell. Just tell them to go. In the name of Jesus, you got to go. I've been with you 60 years. It stops right now. You got to go. Poverty, constant poverty, constant loss of wealth, loss of opportunity. You got to go. 
Come out now. Come out now in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Sit there and do nothing. You get nothing. Speak to him with your word. Speak the word of God. It's a two-edged sword. It'll pierce this devil and cut his head off. He'll have to come out. In the name of Jesus, I use the word of God. I cut your head off, devil. The serpent and the snake and the python, the demons that sit on the spine and the sacrum of people, I loose you. I command you to go. Poor self-worth, loneliness and despair. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Come out now. Loneliness and despair. Not good enough. Not qualified enough. Never have enough. Come out now. Come out now, you growlers of anger. Growlers of stealing. Come out now. Come out now. Now everybody that's going through deliverance, you keep going. Everybody that's struggling, you come to the front right now and you line up. The team's going to pray for you. There's power in numbers. You line up right here across in a straight line and the team's going to come and pray for you right there. Perfect, sir. Perfect. Come out, you devil. If they're going, you keep, keep telling them to go. Stay right in your seat. You got the anointing. Anybody that's waiting for the move of God, just come forward. Come out, you devil. Come out in the name and the authority of Jesus. Come out right now. I place a curse upon all demons that came in through transference. Transfer spirits. I don't care how you got in there. I place a curse of death upon every transfer spirits. Transfer spirits through music. Transfer spirits through sex. Transfer through spirits through guilt and shame. We command you to come out. Manic depression, depression, spirits in the mind. Come out right now. Take a big breath. Come out. Come out. Another one. Come out. Come out. Go. 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 Come out of there. Fight them. Go. Go. Anger and death. Come out. Go. 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 Come out. Go. Keep going. Come out. In the name of Jesus. Bitterness. Backbiting and strife. Come out. Mental illness. Mental illness. We command you to come out right now. Being mentally ill. Being mentally confused. Come out. Schizophrenia. Paranoia. ADD and ODD, I loose your holes. I command you to come out of the people. I command you to come out of the people. I command you to come out of the people. Homosexuality, I place a curse of death on you. Loose the people. Loose their genitals. Come out right now. Lesbianism, homosexual behaviors, homosexual thoughts, I loose you. Sodomy, I loose you. Come out right now. Loose them. You are a liar, devil. You are a liar and the father of lies. Come out now. Come out now. Witchcraft. Generational witchcraft. Generational sorcery. We loose you. Loose the woman of God. Loose. Loose the mind. Loose the mind. Loose the mind. Loose the body. Poor self-image. Come out. Poor self-image. Come out. Lies in her mind that says she lost the youth. She's lost her youth. You're a liar. You're a liar. Loose her. She's a young woman. Loose her right now. Loose her dreams. Loose her hopes. Come out. Take a big breath. Let's go, devil. Take one big cough. Come out. Come out. Come out. Take a big cough. It'll come right out of you. There it is. Come out. There it is. Come out. Come out. Dream stealer. Come out. Dream stealer from abuse. Come out. Dream stealer from abuse. Come out. Dream stealer from abuse. There he is. Abuser. Come out. Men that abused her. Come out. I command the spirits out. Men that abused her physically. Come out. Verbally. Come out. Go. Go. There he is. Go. Go out. Go out. Go out of her mind and body. Go out of her mind. Fight him now. You're getting delivered. Come out. Come out. Who is the man that hurt you real bad? What's his first name? Joe. Joe. Come out, Joe. Joe, you got to come out. You heard her. Joe, we know it was a demon. Come out, Joe. Spirit of Joe, come out right now. You mimic that pain. You remind her of that pain. You remind her of those words. Come out, Joe. Come out. Come out. Joe, come out. Joe, come out. There he is. Joe, come out of there. Come out of the throat. Come out of the chest. Come out, Joe. Come out of there now. You abuser. Take your hands off this woman now. Come out. Come out. Come out. Another big cough. Let him go. That's what's in you. There he is. Go, Joe. Joe and your curse. Come out. Joe and your curse. Come out. Joe and your curse. Come out of there. Come out. Go. Loose her mind and body. Come out of those lower loins. Come out of her woman parts. Go. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out. Abusive men. There he is. Keep going. Keep fighting him. Come out. Come out of there. 
Come out of the man of God. Come out. Come out of there. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Go. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Okay, take a few big breaths. The spirits in her spirits in her mind. Streamers, keep going. I'll be back.